title is Touching the Mind. And I want to, my goal is to elaborate um, and teach you a bit more about the tactile working memory scale, but also about the sense of touch. And as we know, as we work with kids who are deaf blind, it is a very important sense. And it's one that we need to consider when we work with our kids. So the description, what we, I want to do a bit this afternoon is re review, uh, so this is not in order, but to review the importance of the tactile working memory scale, define and understand what is working memory, um, how does working memory work with the sense of touch, uh, the sense of touch and the importance of the deaf blind kids. I have video case studies, question and answers. Um, I will try to, I don't know if I will see everything. If I miss something, please feel free to let me know if there's questions coming through. But first myself, my name is Christine sauvé guindon You can call me Christine in English. For the first and foremost, I'm a mother, a wife. Uh, I have twins who are seven, almost eight, but I'm also stepmom of Francis and Nicola. And when I met my my husband, he also was a stepfather to Cassandra. So we have a, a very large extended family and uh, we have a lot of fun together. Keeps me busy. But who am I professionally? i am uh, been working in the field of deaf blindness for long, uh, over 25 years now. I was a classroom teacher of the deaf blind. Um, I, before that, I was a regular classroom teacher. If um, that exists, a regular classroom teacher, but I was a teacher of the deaf blind. I also work at saint Julie, which I'll tell you a bit more about as a consultant of the deaf blind since uh, September 2000. Uh, I also teach at University of Ottawa to teach the qualification course to, for deaf blindness. Uh, it's a three part course. Uh, I've been a teacher, I've been a consultant. I've had the chance to um, present at really <laughs> international conferences. At the bottom screen was last summer in Ottawa with my colleague Pascal and Jude Nicholas, which is one of the authors of the Tactile Working Memory Scale. So yeah, that was fun. Um, yeah, I am a supervisor. You see uh, the arrow, you'll see myself right behind Casey. So we met actually two North Americans who met in Copenhagen. Um, great opportunity. Ima imagine being in a room with the three authors, uh, authors of the Tactile Working Memory Scale, Jude, um, and all people who work working in the field of deaf blindness. So we don't have to define what deaf blindness is, and we would just we talked and we collaborated and we shared our assessments. And that is me with the three authors that uh, Casey um, introduced this morning. So I work at saint gilles in Ottawa. It is a provincial school, meaning for the entire province of Ontario. Um, we have a learning difficulties program. We also have a school for the deaf, for the blind and deaf blind. We have consultants who work in those three different fields. And I work in the field of deaf blindness. It's also a family affair. I've known this, uh, this school for, I think, since I'm about the age of 10, as my brother was a teacher at the Le uh, Learning Difficulties Program. He became a teacher for the deaf. He became the, uh, as, a, as the program evolved, he became um, person responsible for the residents. He was a consultant, he was a principal, and then he decided to retire. So I've known this I, I became a teacher of the deaf blind, not because of him, but because of another co colleague of his, who uh, Jean, another uh, man who important in my life, Jean-Marc Cholette, who uh, sort of recruited me. And once I got in, I never left. I have, I work with a fantastic team. We're four consultants who travel the province of Ontario. I, Ontario, I like to tease my Texan friends that it's huge. It's bigger than them, bigger than Texas. Um, so we have a lot of little remote places, but we have a lot of uh, bigger cities too that we go so we can fly out to different places. So I'd like to introduce Rene, who is also a supervisor. She did her course, uh, the cohort after myself, Pascal, Carole, and myself. We also have two teachers in the 
uh, at the school part. We have Danielle and Catherine, and we'll be talking about some of their students. So I wanted to do a shout out to them. They're the ones, I can give them the examples, but they're the ones who make the, uh, the magic happen. So, and thank you to our principals. Farouk is the principal of the school program for the deaf, blind, and deafblind. And Gabrielle is our principal of the consultative team where I work. Where are we? I'm uh, Ottawa, if you want to have a better reference geographically. Um, here we are, the black dot. Um, to get a better sense of where is Ottawa compared to where is, you are in Minnesota. Ottawa's here, right? Um, this is where the, I'm sitting right now. I'm not, not in the city. I'm working from home today. So I'm in the right between the little towns of Castleman and Embrun, which is uh, also known as St. Albert's, Ontario. So you see the different borders. I'm in the province of Ontario. There's province of Quebec and Montreal not too far away. And our school is in Ottawa. That's the, uh, the capital of Canada and Montreal. Some of you will know, right? Hockey relation. If you want to talk hockey, we have the Ottawa Senators. They have the Montreal Canadiens. And further south, there's the nasty Maple Leafs. Um, uh, where we are, we're very close to the Adirondacks. If you cross over to uh, from Cornell to from the International Bridge, so that's pretty much where we are. Give you a better geographic sense. Touching the mind, let's start with a little boy named Leo. Leo, we saw him. My colleagues saw him in preschool, and we were getting him ready to go to kindergarten. So four-year-old kindergarten. He's deaf. He's legally blind. He had glaucoma when he was two. So I'm going to share a video of Leo and let's see what we see. All right, so I'll try to switch slides. What did we see? It was just a little boy who was crawling on a bench. There was, I cut out this, uh, the noise because there's just kids running around in the gym. And what did we see? He was really using, once you re-look and, and you analyze the video, you get to see so much potential and how he's using the sense of touch to learn what is a bench in the, on the wall in the gym. He noticed there was those uh, nails, right? And he touched them as he was crawling by. At the end of the bench, when he, when he went over to another bench, he touched both and he felt the gap. So he was finding more vis information to uh, compensate for the visual that he did have or did not have. Then he got to the end of the bench. He touches it, explores it, touches more, one leg down, he realizes at the end, he gets off and we have one happy boy. So look at all that he, we could, if you don't notice it in the first time, but you look at it over and over again, you see how the sense of touch is compensating or is added to, 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 to understand what is a bench. So next time he goes to the gym, probably he'll understand better. So basically touch, what is it offering him? It's helping him to put the pieces of the puzzle together um, because everything for him is probably difficult to understand what's going on around him. 
So this is another video uh, I, I took from my colleague Pascat who went to visit him. Um, he's in outside playing and he said his friend says he's tired. Leo is tired. So little girl said, Leo is tired. And she, yes, she saw him lying around. So Leo said, I'm tired. So the TA started to speak back to him. So, like, so telling him what the next steps of the day. But meanwhile, he's touching something. And I don't know if every, anybody at that point realized. When I found that video, I said, whoa, boy. And we'll talk about that later and what everything that's happening, more so than he's just laying down. But what is touch? Let's just take a break and re really, really think about it. So I'm in Canada, but it, a lot of the things are the same in the States. Uh, we're in a society that says, don't touch. So my cartoon is saying, Patushi, don't touch. Don't touch me. And right, and when we bump into each other, especially since I'm Canadian, I, sorry. And it might not be my fault, but I'll be say it. I'll say it anyways, because you know I went into your bubble and I invaded it and I touched you. When we're on tra transport, public transportation, even if we're stuck sitting together, what do we do? We don't really pay attention to each other. We are touching, but we are trying to control our little personal space. So that little sign says, "Attention, do not touch." So, you know, we just went through a pandemic, which said two meters apart, six feet apart, or as a Canadian would say, a hockey stick apart, don't touch me, stay away. And we go to the grocery store and we put a little, you know, plastic piece of something to say, that's your stuff. And I'm going to put my things down now. And so we're going to keep our things separated. And we're in a touchless society again, and we pay now, we don't even touch the pad. And even if we enter a restaurant and it's full and there's, there's room, but someone's sitting at the table, will you go sit with them? Not really. So touching is something we do, but not reluctantly, but something culturally that we sort of think is it really something that we do all the time? Or are we told not to do, right? When we greet someone, what do we do? Different societies do different things. Um, but basically, touching is only a greeting. And it's stay away afterwards. But I googled deaf blindness. And these aren't pictures aren't mine. They're off the web. When I was talking to the people from Texas, they're saying, I know these kids. I said, yeah, you probably do know some of them. I just looked up. And what do you see right away? You see people touching, people in proximity, people needing to touch each other to be able to play, to learn, to have fun. So without touch, everything that Casey talked about this morning would not have happened. You can't, you have to be able to get in their bubble, be together, and make people understand that proximity is the only way we can do this. So what is touch? In the tactile working memory scale, um, it is, this is right out of the book, and I added cute little pictures for you. So these are the different senses of touch we need to consider with our kids, our students. Light touch, vibration, proprioception, Pain, temperature, pleasant touch, and pressure. So you have to think, when you think of touch, you have to think of all these different sensations that are possible when we are interacting or observing these little kids. 
by the importance of touch to a deafblind person. This is one of our former students, Steve, who his hands were his world, uh, well, his body was anyways, but his hands were so important. And he's literally, we saw the custodians uh, patching the walls before painting, and he did not want to be in the classroom. He would even lie to go and see what was going on in the hallway. But when we let him do it, he would be the best person to sand down the walls because he would make it all perfectly smooth. So the sense of touch to the, our deafblind kids is so important. It's to explore, it's to discover, it's to recognize, it's to learn, decode, communicate, to understand, and really to make sense of the world. The importance to touch to learning Braille and we have to do pre-Braille activities. But I also wanted you to think about that touch is not just your fingers, your hands, but it can be from head to toe, even your nose. So keep in mind that it's bodily tactile, it's everywhere. And the best example I could show you is one of our students having fun. I don't think. She's painting. I knew it. Mom and dad are going to have fun cleaning her up. You're being funny in the hair. And on the mouth, on the mouth. All right, I just wanted to make you laugh a bit. But yeah, but the touch is from everywhere on your body. And Ariane really got herself well, That she, she painted herself pretty well. And mom and dad greeted her at home and had to wash even paint off of her in her hair and everywhere. Um, so sensory motor, right? We'll just review this a little bit. So there is your movements of your body. Um, but they're also the sensory part and the picture, the, the size of the um, your foot compared to the hand, it means how more it's, it's important. So for the sensory part, you see that the face is even more susceptible to touch than maybe your hand or your foot is. So keep that in mind, because I have a lot of kids who will explore with their, their lips, put things up to their cheek or even their tongue. And that's still touch. Um, and then there's the motor part with it too, but it's easier to touch with your hand, right? How can we feel music? How can we touch, right? Feel music if we're deaf. Well, Beethoven taught us that, right? And he could write music because he could feel the music. So that is also to remember that even our deaf kids, how do they perceive different vibrations around them? And there is this beautiful deaf woman, Dame Elizabeth, Evelyn Elizabeth Ann Gleaney from Scotland. And you will have access to this uh, PowerPoint. So please feel free to see. She's also deaf and can play music. So she feels the vibrations. So touch is an integral part of learning and life and intelligence. So if we don't take in consideration the sense of touch, then we're really bypassing something that's very important and crucial. So, and let, let's let, not forget that when we talk about deaf blindness, it's not just deaf plus blind. It's really, really exponentially. So your two distant senses are uh, non-functional. Therefore, you need to really take in consideration everything else that the student can do to learn. So we talked about touch. We've seen an example of Leo. We've seen Ariane having fun. But what is working memory? 
because it's the tactile working memory skill and I have it right here. And if we need to understand what is working memory to understand really to, to go a bit deeper in the uh, concepts. It is the, the system that is responsible for holding and manipulating information. So, if working memory is a cognitive system responsible for temporary holding and manipulating information needed for various complex cognitive tasks, it plays a crucial role in processing and storage of information during ongoing mental activities such as learning, reasoning, reasoning problem solving, and decision making. Okay, let's do an experiment. Um, I'm going to say five words to you. And, and then we'll have, I'll continue. So the five words are ocean, house, astrology, spoon, and continent. All right. No, I want you to multiply 39 by 7. Once you know the answer, please write it in the chat. 39 times 7. Um, if you can, can you recite the five letters of five last letters of the alphabet in your head? I'm going to count to 10 in LSQ, but I think it's the same as at ASL. Let's see. Un, deux, trois, quatre, cinq, six, sept, huit, neuf, six. Did you write the answer to the multiplication yet? Now, um, what question is, how many words do you remember? And probably you remembered maybe one or two, or did you remember, how many did you remember? If you didn't write it down, you probably was gone, right? So, because I asked you so many other tasks to be able to do and hold on to that information. But I did that on purpose, of course. But these were the words. Ocean, house, astrology, spoon, and continent. Usually, we can bring back, they say, one or two words. But um, it's difficult. So working memory involves a wide range of cognitive tasks, such as understanding language, problem solving, reading comprehension, learning new information. Deficits in working memory are associated with difficulties in academic performance in various cognitive tasks. Assessment like the tactile working memory scale mentioned earlier are designed to measure specific aspects of working memory, helping researchers and education educators understand and address cognitive challenges. So the keys to working memory are temporary storage. I asked you to try to remember five words, right? Then there's the active processing of doing a, a whole bunch of what of other tasks that I asked you to do. And then our brain had a limited capacity to hold on to everything that was required and told to do. And it's a multi-component uh, comp system, right? We were adding, I was signing, I was speaking in French and signing and multiplications, write it in the chat, all that and trying to hold on to five different words. So that is working memory. These are they're described for you in, in context. So like I explained, temporal storage, active processing, limited capacity, multi-component system. But this was all done in auditory information when I gave to you and in visual information, right? What if you're deafblind? How do you hold on to that information? How do you do working memory if you cannot hear or limited and your sight is limited? So the tactile sense, this is straight out of the book. The 
<laughs> sorry, my, my English sometimes, the camarada between people and with time blindness in various degrees is also that they perceive information mainly or only through the tactile sense. Tactile sense or the sense of touch include multiple times, types of sensation received from the surface or inside the body. We should not view deaf blindness as a negative state, right? Of being in which sight and hearing are not there, but instead as, as a positive state, in which active touch, bodily movement, posture, hand gestures are all preeminent source of information. Touch will be an important sense for learning for these deaf blind kids. So I'm, pretend you have a, a blindfold on it and that you can't hear me. Now imagine now that I put a set of keys in your hand and I ask you, find the key that opens the door to your house. There might be 10 or 12 keys on that set of keys and you're actively now with a sense of touch trying to find that one key that will let you into the house. We sort of all live this, you know, where it's dark outside and we're trying to get, you know, get in. So what are you doing? Feeling. Trying to figure out where the, the dents are. Or is it round? Right? So you're using all the tactile information that you can to be able then to get to the doorknob and get the key into the hole. Well, which key is it, right? And all this kind of information on there, we won't see the color if we're, and we're in the dark, but all that kind of sense that we could be looking for or feeling for to be able to get the right key. So tactile exploration is the lateral motion, right? Rubbing, stroking, encoding the texture of the keys. You did pressure. You did enclosure, framing closely the object surface, contour following. And then there was unsupported holding, lifting or encoding with, oh, there's a mistake, with the keys. So trying to, to uh, figure out how to hold it and, and it's how it feels to finally have the right key to get inside your house. Let's go back to Leo. He was on the floor. He was tired. Maybe he was. Um, but what was he doing? He had lateral motion. He was rubbing. He was playing with those blocks. He was encoding something. He was adding pressure with his fingers, even if it was slight. He was framing the shape, um, contouring. But he wasn't holding it, of course. But he, what he was doing was learning what is a triangle probably, or this block that was in, in, in proximity of the sense of touch. No need to be looking and he could be lying down and doing this. So tactile exploration, let's pretend like of the blocks, this is what he was doing, right? And how tactile objects now for the kids who are deafblind, all is around them will be so much more important. So this is a, pers a picture I stole from the Perkin website, but what's a banana? We can think about a banana. We know a banana has a shape, it has, right? We can do it again. So just think of all the different pictures ahead of us, right? How we can contour it, hold it. Um, even if it looks different, if we do have limited vision, it, a banana is sort of a banana. As it gets more ripe or rotten, well, it, the texture, well, you know, the pressure you can change on it, how to open it. And this will all help us understand what is a banana, right? So, a little commercial, the tactile working memory, uh, if you went on their website of the Nordic Center, they had this running.
And as Casey said, you can download the book and it's totally free. Another book I want to do uh, to present is if you can see it, you can support it about um, a book on tactile language. I could send that, that information for this book, but that's also on the website. And I find that, that it goes really, really well with the tactile working memory scale. How do our kids um, sign or what are they doing that could be perceived as language, even if it's not a real sign or a real word? What are they telling us? So wait, change slides. I'm taking a course with Perkins right now as we speak. And um, one of the blogs that we had to read was really got to me because it really gives you an idea. Sometimes what we do as a sighted or a hearing person, um, it says, why aren't you looking at the avocado as the girl is trying, is cutting it? And she answered, I can't see the avocado. But you should be looking at the avocado while you're cutting it. But I can't see it. Just look at the avocado. I turned my head down towards where I knew my hands were and continued cutting the avocado. There, were, uh, there she was satisfied. I was looking at what I was doing while I was doing it. But she wasn't looking. She was all doing it with a sense of touch. So we, and we're going to have to have a mind shift about what is the student doing? Because maybe they're not looking like Leo was laying down on, in the park or on the deck playing or touching those blocks. She continues, except I wasn't really looking. I learned how to pretend like I was looking at what my hands were doing just so I could keep the peace and move on. So, and then she continues in her blog. I remember one night I was mincing garlic in the kitchen and the person I lived with came into the kitchen. Even though she had never reprimanded me to look at things, my social conditioning kicked in and I put in my head down. But I forgot one crucial detail, turning on the kitchen lights. Then it came to me. I, then, it, it, then it came, I know you can see you can't see anyways, but can you just turn the lights on anyways? It'll make me feel better. So I did. Even though she intellectually knows that I don't do things visually, some part of her still is still reassured by the illusion that I'm using my eyes, that I'm looking, that I need the lights on. Most sighted people can't help themselves. And many CVIers have built ways of doing things ar around this fact. So that for me was so like, oh my God. So what do we sometimes do or, <laughs> or, or, or perception might be warped that what we're trying, thinking what we're seeing and we're not seeing or we're not permitting them to do, right? Um, so yeah. So I'll let you read the quotation. You couldn't read it right the first one, but maybe some of you could if you knew French. But if I, I uh, decided to judge you on the capacity of reading French, then I would have missed the point. So that was really pretty much the point with what, what I read of what Nye wrote in her blog. So why is the tactile working memory scale so important? Once you read the book, you go through it, you live the assessment and you see it, you're going, oh my God, I have something which I can score these kids who do things differently. Because most of our psychologically psychological tests, scoring scales, what do they do for cognition, communication, comprehension? They're all visually and auditory based. So how reliable are results for testing for kids who cannot rely on their sense of vision and hearing? And I was helping a, um, a speech pathologist a few weeks ago, and she wanted to see how this student could communicate, but all her test was visually based. So I said, well, you can't do it that way. 
And it was like, oh my God, but if I don't do it this way, the scoring, I, I don't, I'm not using the test properly. So we had to talk about how, what she wanted to score and how we could adapt the test to it but also use um, different strategies, visual strategies for sure, but maybe render it more tactile to make it fair. So see really what he could do and not do. It's the same thing. I had a student once and they told me she was, um, wasn't very smart just to say, uh, be very polite in my terms because she couldn't hold scissors and cut. And I said, why on earth could you tell me the, the intellectual capacity of someone who cannot see on the ability to cut a piece of paper? So we have to really, I, what I love about the tactile working memory scales, you see that even at the beginning, it, it, insignificant things are so important. And I have a way of saying, like you saw Mason this morning, Yes, I can check a lot of those boxes. And yes, they are there. And wow, did you see this? Did you see what he just did? Right? So I want a more reliable way to be able to assess some of the kids who are tactile learners. So if the information from the, the sense of hearing and, and sight is not the best one, Let's use something that is more appropriate to them, right? So, so here is Leo in the class. He's sitting down. The sense of touch is crucial for individuals who are deafblind. This often serves as a primary channel of communication, information gathering, and environmental awareness. Deafblindness refers to a combined loss of both hearing and vision, and touch becomes a vital means of connection with the world. Here are my puzzle pieces again. With dual sensory loss, right? The world is fragmented, we know that. So intervention or what we can do is to help put the pieces of, of the puzzles back together. And if we really let them use a sense of touch, right? To be able to learn, to uh, adapt and everything else. A learning environment that lets a child explore is so important. And using the sense of touch and letting him or her experience a touch-based programming, right? Experience-based programming. So important to the deafblind child. So the importance of touch for communication, orientation and mobility, social interaction, learning through touch, environmental awareness, expressing emotion. And these are all components that the tactile working memory scale tries really tries to tag on to and right and to make sure that we look at all these different angles to what the kids are doing and don't forget all the different possibilities of touch so we need to think tactile to get to get it and this is a blog of someone who who works with um, autistic kids and described very, very well the sense of touch. So I added the link if you want to look at it later on, just to think tactile. Okay, let's go into a few case studies. And I'm not going to go in depth like we did with Mason this morning or they did with Mason this morning. I want you to have a sense, can I use this tool? Anybody can. Um, can I score it as of tomorrow? Maybe not. But to be aware and looking, putting on your lenses of touching and the sense of touch that it's there and what the child is doing. That is, I think, if you can take that takeaway from today, 
then you're, you're heading in the right direction. I will present Campbell. Um, and Campbell, in the first video, you will hear his parents um, talking about how he likes his motorcycle rides. And think about motorcycle rides, that it's, it's bodily, tactile, the body um, awareness and feeling riding the motorcycle, right? And the revving, the stopping, the, the vibrations and everything else. So let's look at that. All right, so how do we tell Campbell he's going to go ride his motorbike? And if he wants to ride his motorbike? I'm sure he does. And he doesn't live too far from here. And there's some day I see him riding by. I live in the country and I'll see, I'll hear, and I'll see the sidecar. And I'm, he's smiling big, wide and happy to feel the, the wind and uh, to be riding with Papa, with his dad. Wait, change slides. All right. So working memory let's just think it a little bit about working memory let's not go too deep into the tactile working memory scale all right just we'll look at these words this is directly from the book again how jude uh, graphed out working memory so there is social interactions with his parents for sure there is communication for sure too right and he's got the ability to focus and pay attention and remember to instruction and demonstrate self-control. That's there for sure. Memory of riding the bike in the past, anticipating that it's going to happen, right? The use of his tactile cue to say yes or no, but also touching the helmet. He knew what that was. He knew what that meant. And probably, like I said, remembered being on the bike, the sensations, the feel. Touching his cues, feeling the vibration, the wind. Uh, to communicate his answers, he had to execute without forgetting the task. So there is working memory happening. So this is Campbell again. How do we... Um, how can we use the sense of touch to learn? Um, I put at the side of the, uh, the screen, the yarn, bo uh, yarn bombing, deaf blind awareness of, uh, there was an invitation sent to a lot of schools for the deaf blind or, you know, people working with deaf blind adults and kids to join in the uh, yarn bombing activity in the month of June, 2021. Um, we're in full-fledged pandemic. There's Pascal, one of my colleagues who was back when, back then in the classroom and Campbell was a student. We wanted to do uh, the yarn bombing and we wanted, we wanted a square, uh, crocheted or knitted square from each kid in the province that we supported. And that was our goal. And we were gonna make a big blanket to represent each kid. But how do we then start it from the, group, the ground roots at the roots level? Well, Campbell needs to know what is yarn and to touch yarn and to manipulate yarn. Because if someone is going to, going to be working with him 
on this square piece if he can or cannot knit or maybe see it getting bigger or touching it he needs to understand what is the concept of yarn so here is pascal telling him you're going to be touching wool Christine, when you're sharing your video, could you make sure that the audio is uh, checked? Um, people are saying they're not hearing the video. Okay, then. Wait a minute. I will stop sharing. I probably missed the box. But this one I can play. I'll, I'll, I'll edit. I'll speak through it. Okay? So, Pascal is presenting the yarn. Exploring. You see his fingers moving. Pascal is asking, what's that? It's wool, you're touching. And you see his fingers starting just to be there on it, accepting to touch it. Looking and listening is really hard to do. And he's exploring because he's not pulling his hand away, right? Are you touching? Yeah. And by Pascal's reaction, we know that he's enjoying it. Pascal just laughed. All right. So I'll, I don't know, some of the volumes of, uh, I don't have the audio, audio either. So I'm gonna stop the share and I'm gonna make sure that I'm doing this properly, okay? Did I miss something? Probably I could have. I don't see anything for vol, you know, to check for the box for volume or to have uh, sound. Wait, not true. Nope, I don't see it there either. Share sound, found it. There you go. Zoom changed again. I will click here. Sorry about that. Can you, I'm hoping they'll be able to hear now. <laughs> All right. All right. So I don't have the end product for uh, Campbell, but I wanted to show you something that just recently, recently happened. Um, yeah. Thank you for your help, Anne. Um, each student in the province created, like I said, a square. And this is Joshua's square. And this one was made where a lot of homeschooling happening or kids couldn't go. We were really locked down in, over here in Ontario. Um, but he did get to do his square and decorate it like, like it with. And you see in the background of the screen on the TV, which I really like this picture, you see mom taking the picture. So, so and then fast forward to right we went to his school yeah just not too long ago in january and we brought the blanket all completed for the first time and this gave me shivers and i'll let you look in and you'll hear the team too <laughs> Tu as choisi des poissons pour ton aquarium. Uh -huh. Tu as choisi la balle avec l'eau pour ta piscine. Ça, ça représente Joshua Bio. Ah, ouais. Quand il reconnaît Joshua. Ah, c'est. Ça, c'est ses réactions. Good job. Ah, tu reconnais bien. So the teacher is saying when she's presenting the uh, the, the square that he had done uh, that he recognizes it because when he recognizes something, he laughs. And she went through it. Do you remember doing this? You did like the, the basketball and all the elements to it. Um, there is a lot of visual recognition, but when he did do the square initially, it was all tactile. He was helping sew on that square and the choice making he did of that. Who, so there is a memory of doing it, of course, and him be able to um, 
now, what, th three years later, and remember it. So there is bravo, memory. Et puis là, regarde, on a le... C'est moi qui ai des frissons, là. Regarde, on a le A pour Autumn. Ah, oh, tu trouves ça drôle, peux tu toucher? Do you want to touch the A for Autumn? A pour Autumn. So, yeah, so then he went and explored. He recognized the name Autumn to one of his uh, classroom friends and went and explored her square. Okay. So just, just with that experience of what did I see? So don't have to score the entire thing, but what do I, I could pull out of this? He did have encode, maintain, and manipulate right? So he was tactile focused. We know that he had object mani manipulation. He, ex he accepted at the beginning when he did the square to touch, right? Tactile object identification. He had sustained attention and there was interaction time. He, there was a big emotional perception there was this tension switching that was occurred by going from his square to his friend's squares also. So you don't have to go deep, deep and say, uh, I have to do a whole tactile, you know, a tactile working memory scale assessment, but just on one little piece, on one little interaction, you can sort of picking out why I love this, uh, this scale, because it shows a lot more than, and I, I don't want to say it shows a lot more, but it shows you exactly the, what Joshua can do and he's doing, right? With his uh, limitations. But this is our yarn bombing. That was a blanket that ended up being done with all the squares, one square for each student in the province. Um, we are try starting to try bring it to different schools as you saw, but I wanna show you that. Joshua was there, there he is. was uh, Joshua with his in, in that part we did that uh, video uh, we couldn't during the pandemic travel with the blanket yet but what we could do we made a video and different schools different classes different parents school boards got to see the blanket being made and all the pr people who contributed contributed to making it those are little press Here's oh C'est connu. Ça ressemble à des seins, mais oui. Pas rapport, c'est juste qu'il peut les tenir. background is another student but so I'll turn off the sound and I'll narrate through it what I see he's holding the two cups that he's very interested he does use his vision once in a while um, his feet are on on the washing machine it's giving him a lot of information on the sense of touch, of course. It is giving him the sense of the vibrations. He will put the cups on the washing machine and feel the vibrations through the cups also in his hands. He's, uh, motion of turning does attract his visual attention. Um, and notice then when it ends, he doesn't feel the vibrations anymore. There's no information that's fun to be perceived, so he walks away. Here we go. So the cops are ad adding the, the vibration, right? 
feeling the cups on his teeth also. It's turning, feeling with his feet also. And it, when he removed his hands, it was stopping. And then when he gets up, there's no more sensation at all. Well, you're feeling something, you look towards it. Done, and gets up. So there's a lot of ha a lot of little things happening, and it just a little what it lasts about a minute. There's this. He did go back to it. I'm just showing you a little limited time. Um, but what did I learn from observing Daniel at the washing machine? Um, the attention between the bowls and the washing machine. He could do do two things at the same like two, um, but the bowls were were adding information for sure. His feet are feeling the vibrations. Feet are as important, right, as the hands in tactile exploration. He's a little boy that if we he has the choice, he doesn't want to wear shoes. He likes feeling with his feet. Vibrations are very interesting, stimulating. When he felt uh, the cycle ending, he looked for confirmation. Something was different, right? It was not vibrating as much in the, during the spin cycle. I think that's the washer. Vibration ended, he knew the cycle was done. Not seen, he also explored the machine with his lips and the, the teacher assistant got up and tried to remove his mouth. She said, well, it's dirty. And I just joked around saying, is your machines dirty or he's gonna dirty it, just clean it. But, but I explained to him that that he needed to also touch and that the information he got from that was probably confirming what he was feeling with his hands or through the cups and his feet. And he spatial awareness of the location of the, of the machine because he got up and walked around and came back to it. And sometimes he'd walk into the classroom and go near it to see if it was on and vibrating. So he knew where that machine was in the room. Let's see Daniel again. Um, how is this activity significant? And does it show cognition? Okay. Does this activity show cognition or is it just self stimming? Is it just something he's doing passively? Well, I could tell you that there's a lot of knowing him and observing this with him. I turned the, I don't want to call it in English, but the thing over to the other side. And he knew spatially where the red wire went. It, that day he was really playing a lot with the yellow one. But he knew put, where to put his hand to feel it. Sometimes he was looking and, and other times he wasn't looking to touch. Um, but he was basically very spatial aware of all the um, different, the, the yellow uh, root, the red one or the blue one, where it started and where, where it ended. Um, 
and he was really enjoying that game. So with that, what did we see? I'll change slides. Um, what I could observe from both the activities, uh, a tactile focused attention, um, object manipulation, ventral stream function, tactile object identification, object location, where it like began and ended, where the washing machine is, uh, tactile object recognition, tactile spatial recognition, tactile sustained attention, um, interaction time, right? So all of this we're seeing with this, and we would say that it's passive, he's not doing much, but he is doing lots in both instances. So in the tactile working memory scale, we want to say, what can we learn from this and what can we do to promote learning? So, okay, so we have the interaction partner, but there's none right here, he's alone, right? And then there's a person, there's Danielle. And together we can work on working memory. But right now this is a passive one, but there's still something. How could I come and play with him, be in interaction with him and make him learn more things? from what I've just saw that there, right? So let's, let's, he's very social. I don't want you to think that he's not by what he's doing in that he's a very social little boy. And here's Reni, our newest supervisor on our team who is incorporating social skills with them. My turn, your turn, learning to sign more. Do you want more vibrations and watching for communication? So I'll play it for a little bit. So us as a team, how can now we interact with what we know he likes for him to be able to do more? He's just asked for more. Right? So we have to learn from what is really a child led to be able to do to guide him and to be able to strive to do more with him. Right. Next slide. Here is Gideon. I will um, explain the context of this. This is one of my favorite videos. When, when I took this video, it was pre-pandemic, 2019-ish, um, um, and I had just finished doing other assessment. I, I had read the tactile working memory scale. I was not a supervisor, um, I, but I knew I had a gem here, and I knew I had something, a video that I could help train the staff at the school. So Gideon is uh, legally blind. He can see basically maybe two meters ahead in front of him. Uh, his hearing... Uh, is probably there's there's a hearing loss, but we're now thinking there's probably some, something centrally happening also um, that will have to be tested eventually. Um, he's at this point he's in kindergarten and the pack sack. Well, he's uh, tube fed, so to be able to do his activities like everybody else, he has to bring his pack sack along. Um, but you're looking at him. He's in gym. He's supposed to be running around. What's happening? He's noticing the gym teacher putting something new in the gym. So I'll narrate it because it was narrated in French originally. Oops. Gideon est au gymnase avec ses amis. I'll do that. So Gideon is in the gym with his friends and he notices something new. He's looking, right, as much as he can. But when he was running, he probably didn't notice it from far. But now that he's there, hmm, he's exploring. But we're told he's not supposed to be doing that. He's supposed to be running. Oh, look at that. He just noticed a second post. End of the first video. Second video clip, he comes back and look at what he's doing with his head. He's touching with his head. He's figuring out hmm, how far it goes. And with his head goes underneath, feels it. Right, but that again, I'll call the third clip. So that's not what he's supposed to be doing. So we're trying to get him to come and run some more. But here he is feeling it with his nose now. 
And it's the third time that he's told that he should not be there, but he should be running like the other people in the room, in the gym. But he looks back and joins his friends. So what did I learn once I had looked through it through the tactile working memory scale lens? And knowing that it's a dynamic assessment, the tactile working memory scale, I met with the staff when I could, eventually when we got back to normalcy and said, look at this, what did you miss? And what did we um, could have done, right? So here is Gideon observing, touching with face, hair, cheeks, nose, right? He just noticed something new called a volleyball net. That wasn't there the day before. Will it be there again tomorrow? I don't know. But what is this? So I told them they had a teachable moment, a aha moment that we could have taught them what was in the gym. So a dynamic assessment, what it does is you meet up and you talk about it. So I shared this video. And then, right, once you, you talk about it and you understand what you're seeing, I say, okay, any other time during the school day that he has teachable moments, Let's take the time and learn from it to be able then to say, ah, Gideon didn't know that there was what was happening. He didn't have every sense available that we have, distance sentence, to figure this out. And he needed to put the puzzle pieces together. So let's help him do it, right? So what the team does is optimizing the physical and social environment within the body tactile modality mediating effective working memory strategies within the body, bodily tactile modality. And then we can do to reassess. A whole, uh, reassess a whole wad of uh, tactile working memory skill or reassess a, an activity, something that happened during um, an activity, something that happened at school with sense of touch. And I love this quote, do the best you can until you know better. When you do, when you know better, do better, right? So the reevaluation part of it, it's to quote Robbie Leha from Texas. She says, you rinse and you repeat, right? You continue updating your knowledge on your student. So then if you know other things that he do, like there's another teachable moment when I was there with him last year, he heard a tape a big box tape dispenser. He didn't know what it was. Um, he heard it, didn't know, didn't have a visual image of it. So I, we, I told him, finish your lesson. We'll show you later. We'll show it. We, show, we showed it with his fingers. So now he had an, a teachable moment. He heard something, didn't make sense. Uh, he, now he got to touch it. He got to pull on it. He got to see the teeth of the tape dispenser for the boxes, moving boxes, and he got to explore. Now he knew what that was. So anytime a, a, a situation like that happens, you have um, a sense that you can get to revise and how you contribute to the student. And you can add new strategies, right? So, and if need be, you get to update the, the IEP. So let's go like who's the interaction partner in this in the case of right Gideon it's us it's everybody who works with him at that school he doesn't have the luxury of having an intervener traded uh, trained so say he has teacher assistants and he's in a little town um, and so basically it's maybe someone from the town who could who was hireable and could work with him so how do we then help them? It's the, having the entire school come together and say, what can Gideon, we've had team meetings for him. So what can he see? What can he perceive? How, what are these teachable moments? And so on. And when you know better, you can do better. And this will all help in that sense, in that, in that memory, know what a volleyball net is. And maybe another day it will show up again and maybe tell them and let's go explore it again. And the following day might not be, right? Sean was my uh, 
my project with uh, my partner was from British Columbia, which is three time zones away. Um, so being tactile curious would be the best way that I can describe our boy, Sean, but he has, he's got CVI and um, auditory neuropathy. Uh, so looking and, uh, looking and touching is very difficult, but he touches, he wants to learn and his hands are so important to him, well, his old body, but his hands, his feet, you know what I mean, but it's, he's very tactile curious, that's how I would describe him. And when I started to do the tactile working memory scale, you see Catherine, that's the teacher you heard laughing with Ariane. Um, uh, she said, well, okay, I'll go look through my, we've got loads of, he loves pictures, Sean. So we have so many pictures. We, every day we have about 50 new pictures of his world um, and activities he does. So she went through some of them and I will share them with you. This is Sean doing math. So of course he needs to, you know, objects to help him count. He loves numbers. So if you give him a number, he will try to reproduce it easily. And the blocks are a way easily that he loves to do it. Uh, so Sean, um, like I said, cannot look and uh, touch simultaneously. So that's one thing. One of his, uh, discoveries that year was he found out that when you close the door, the, the, the door it's on the door jam but you know there's a hole in there and like oh are those holes clean or dirty and what how big he likes holes he likes to know what things if it's a tunnel or something so he explored and that every door probably had one so he went to almost every door he could find in the school um screws screws are way and born they're really fascinating what way are they directing, looking? He's looking right now, but then he'll go touch them. Um, but I know that he feels uh, the handrails and I bet you he knows what area of the school he is without using sight by the touch of the, them. That's him at the swimming pool. These pictures were not taken the same day, but there's touching at screws and he's also discovering where the water comes out or the water comes in. So when I did the, the, the tactile working memory scale, I'll show you the score and all that, but uh, I didn't write a formal report. You can, uh, we were working on how that could be, how can that look? But what I did to present to in Copenhagen and also to present to the school is I did this video. Uh, I'll make sure the volume is up and I close captioning is on, wait. Yes, it is, okay. I'm go play. Sean likes screws. He likes cleaning and making sure things are tidy. And this week, his fascination has been door jams and how he could make sure that screws are clean. So right now he's asking for Catherine to help him to clean it because he can't really look and do the actions simultaneously. Notice his left hand and his head for support for him to be able to look. But then, telltale sign of CVI comes in. Can't look and touch simultaneously, but so enjoys doing this activity with Catherine coactively. And he makes sure that the tweezers are back on his calendar system for tomorrow. Tomorrow we get to do that again. And it's a tactile cue for now, as we didn't change it into a word or a picture. Because, you know, new activities usually have a tactile component to it. And he wants to make sure that I know. Did I hear it? Did I get it? Tomorrow, we're going to go and use the tweezers and we're going to go around the school. We're also going to go swimming. We are going to go in clean again, right? Ah! Ah! Lunch time. As he goes in, you'll notice that he touches the handrail. He always touches it underneath and seeks tactile information. Did you see that? 
Oh, now he's talking about tomorrow. Tomorrow he'll be doing something fun. Tomorrow, Tuesday. But I want you to notice as he's going down the stairs, how he gets information for, from the handrail, going down step by step. And at the end, the handrail offers him the information that he's at the ground, at the bottom, and so does his foot. Right there, feels, touches, and goes on. Touching and looking is so hard for him because of his CVI. Now imagine trying to pick up cucumbers. Mm. Nope. He's trying now. He's really trying. Got it. Here we are at the park, and he's exploring a maple tree, the leaves of the maple tree. He can't look and touch at the same time. He uses his free hand to sort of void out what he sees, to concentrate on what he's touching. Uh, see? Then he goes back, holds on to the railing, and looks at Catherine exploring, this time the pine tree. It's soft. It's soft. Look. And look at his finger. He's doing the motion that she's doing. And takes a chance, looks down, and explores. Oh, did it. Good job. <laughs> Sean and his manholes. What can I say? He's fascinated by them. Oh, just found a hole. Will he find the other one? There's a second one on the other side. Oh, exploring. Here we go. Found it. Mm -hmm. Good job. Right. Last stop, the bowling alley. Here he is exploring. Sense of touch. Sitting. Touching. And the ball too. Through the entire process of the assessment, I um, talked to the mom a lot, Elizabeth, and I, when I finished the video before going to Copenhagen, I asked her, what do you think? I always like to get parental input, right? Um, but also get them on board. Um, and this is what she wrote, right? So this is Sean during, through the years. Um, I'm delighted by the video. It's incredible to see how those little fingers are collecting information and helping him place his body within the noisy environment. You might have noticed he has a uh, cochlear impl implant also. Um, so how to decipher all the noise he hears or not. And here he is a picture in the school um, with his parents. And it's always my way of thanking parents for letting me borrow their child to do something so amazing as go to Copenhagen. So, yeah. But it's also important, and I'll use Sean as an example, that you need to figure out what factors limit touch, right? Um, some kids might have CP and they're in their wheelchairs. We might like Cam uh, Campbell. We might have to bring something to him right that he won't necessarily go explore by himself so what are the limiting factors um, for Sean it's is CVI looking and touching simultaneously um, it's a muscle strength he, you can't perceive it but he has um, CP and he limps on one side so one side of his body is better than the other um, proprioception body awareness and motor planning so how to bring his elbow uh, to bring an arm in proper position to sign. Vestibular balance and equilibrium. And time, multi-sensory convergence. You saw him with touching the pine tree. How much it will take him to, he's a unisensory learner. He needs to look or he needs to, he can't look and touch at the same time. He will listen. Can he be touching at the same time or doing all that together to put the pieces of the puzzle together? So that's important for him to know and to be able to motor planning, like, you know, taking the pincers to pick up the food um, to be able to do it. So please, with your students, try to figure out what can he do with touch, but what 
there are, are, are there limits to, to understanding how they do or can touch. Of course, we rated him. That was part of the, of the, we can do a full one, but full assessment on kids. We had, we had a full load of videos, um, but it's not the, the amount of videos that we had for Sean. Like I said, with other examples, you could look through a little piece, of one video or one happening in a day and score a whole different aspects of it and see how you can improve it with a dynamic assessment. But also in the, the discussion you know, we have, we had some that we weren't sure about if they were in the emergent, were they really present? Um, and sometimes it was us who didn't see it. So we had to do other activities to be able to perceive it. I said, well, it wasn't him, it was all about us. So what could we then um, do? But in other cases, what did we miss? So did we offer him the opportunity to show us different activities. So with the pincers, I, again, this is not me. This is all Catherine. Um, Sean loves numbers. And he had sort of pulled the fire alarm one day. Um, so let's teach him what the fire alarm is. But everyone, he knows numbers everywhere in the school. He could bring you to different numbers anywhere. He knows that number of switches and um, the intercoms on the ceiling have numbers. Um, these light switches have numbers. Uh, the receptacles where we plug in our computer have numbers. He has explored them all. So he loves numbers. We taught him that what the that little red thing was that he wasn't supposed to pull uh, for fun. So Catherine did a marvelous activity going around the school. Seriously, that's the number seven. He had to then practice picking up the pieces the amount of numbers doing a math skill at the same time and putting in the little cup and and but then we can still see that noise in the background will bug him i think the clip is short yeah if you looked at the whole clip sometimes he, he raises his hair head because he can hear one of the teachers talking in one of the classrooms and that's him in the cafeteria, remember, with the cucumbers. And because of that activity, and, you know, when we know better, we do better. Okay. Nabal broccoli. Okay. Ah, et chou-fleur. Okay. Bravo. Two. Okay. Puis vert. Les broccoli. Broccoli. Et un. So... He's doing a lot better. And the cafeteria could be totally noisy and he can even do it when it's a noisy environment now. So like I said, we, we reevaluated him, but those ones that we scored lower, we weren't sure if it, that we were the ones who missed it. So, or we had really figured things out yet, but that's part of the game too. That's fun. Looking at time. Okay, Hunter, you see he was also part of our, yarn bombing um or a blanket that we did and that's his his square he i asked his parents to always send us a picture with the square so we can identify who did what but his was easy he had a name on it um but look he's showing it for me for the picture for the camera he's not looking he's touching and he's feeling so him to, to be able to see is to be able to touch. His hands are so much and so important. Um, when I went to visit him at the school, he heard me coming in with my, my briefcase and he said, I have one just like you. I said, you do? Really? Yes, I do. And he went and got his. And we explored everything that was similar to mine and his the handle and and the zippers and everything compartments well I had more compartments so he thought mine was way cooler but then I told him I said yours is you've got a beautiful spider-man it's nice and red and red is the color he likes but he was really fascinated so we explored our briefcases our tactile moment with our sense of touch and if you really really observe who is hunter everything is done with touch 
everything. So he's sitting at when he was younger uh, at the shelving. He was exploring the classroom when no one was in there, no noise. And he now discovered where the what shelves were. Um, and that asking me why there was basket in some and why there wasn't in others. And then he's sitting and playing one day. That was last year. But everything we were doing pretty much playing with this house and his dinosaurs was all uh, tactile based. Um, I would hide things from him, but he wouldn't look for it. He would feel for them in different rule, rooms. Um, and I'm now questioning with him every, you know, he could residual vision because of CVI. We wanted him to learn how to write Hunter, right? But it was so visually based so sometimes i'm wondering why didn't why we, maybe we should be doing with tactile based and you see the letters on the filing cabinet on the third picture uh, maybe we should be doing it another way instead of focusing on his vision so i'm learning too uh pascal and carol the other two members i know they're looking right now salut pascal hello carol um there aren't supervisors yet but they're here today listening to the training. Uh, they love this morning, learned a lot. Thank you, Casey and uh, Texas team. And, but, I don't care, I'll start chatting. Um, but I told them in the beginning, we did a lot. We did training when I came back from Copenhagen. I made them listen to a video that I will give you access to. Um, I told them, read, get to know the book, do what we did at the beginning, but also look tactile. And... And the kids that you saw today, Leo, it's Car Carol and Pascal assessed Leo. It wasn't me. I got to see the videos. I got to see the magic. Um, Pascal is Ariane's, the girl that painted herself. Uh, that's Pascal's daughter, but she's also on my caseload. So I get to work with awesome people. I'm lucky. So we're back at, We're back to square one with Leo. Um, but because of training and because of, you know, sharing and talking about how can we educate the staff at Leo was going into kindergarten, JK, what could we do? Um, train the staff who's going to be working with them. So there's Carol. And we also have a vision consultant um, here and another deaf consultant because he's got deaf and blind of course and we're working as a team and that's the school staff who was going to be um, uh, starting to work with Leo in September and that's uh, Leo made a fantastic video how she was uh, grateful to us at saint julie but I just want to play the end of it <laughs> that's Leo saying thank you saint julie so thank you, Leo. And it always makes me happy to hear that. So, all right. So if you, another clip of, because of videos like that, I'm talking about tactile working memory and talking about how we can do it differently. This is Leo who will, he's taking apart a sandwich. And I won't play the whole six minutes of it, but basically, it's meatloaf, I think, put in a sandwich, and there's lettuce on his plate. But he took the time to remove everything, to figure out maybe what everything is. At the beginning, you might think that he didn't like lettuce, but I think he ate it. <laughs> yeah, Pascal wrote, it was a, a, a contender for the cutest kid ever. So removing lettuce. Um, he, uh, he put his lips to the bread. I think he, uh, and later on the video, I don't, to show the whole clip, um, look what, uh, exploring. I don't need a, why do I need a fork? Right. I'm going to open it up. I'm going to touch it. Oh, maybe I like that. Residual. He, get, oh, he found a piece. And uh, he finally ate it, but he didn't eat it as a sandwich. He ate it uh, a little bit at a time. Oh, Carol added, he's not used to this kind of bread for his sandwiches. So this was all new to him, right? 
but he was learning. So, but if we would have disciplined him saying, you took your sandwich apart and you're not eating, you would, have you would have missed that teachable moment that I was talking about earlier about Gideon. Right. So because of sh teaching or showing the staff these clips and reanalyzing them and coaching the staff, now they're more aware of these teachable moments and why he's doing what he's doing. So what are Leo things, right? And that touch is so much more important than we would perceive it to be. Carol will remember this one student, Zachary, we're in, in Northern Ontario years ago. Um, and this boy, I don't have a picture. Um, here's a story. Yeah, Timmins. And he would always have dirty hands because he would always put his hands when he would, people would push him around the school, not on the hand part of the wheel, but on the wheel itself. But if you looked and really paid attention, he was doing that because he wanted to feel when he was being turned, when he was being pushed. And if one wheel was turning, he knew he was going one way or the other, right? It was all in the sense of touch. And I still remember that story because back then I thought, wow, this kid is brilliant. But we saw it as him getting calluses to his hands. And we saw it, not me, but others as dirty. Was, let's put gloves on him. But if you put gloves on him, you're putting Vaseline on his glasses, right? It'd be the same thing. You're not letting him explore and learn and, and be able to um, understand or be a participant in being uh, pushed around in the school and going where this is could be orientation and mobility, right? And then there was another kid I remember and him it was touching as he was going faster down the hallway or being pushed he was the hand would come out and would feel the lockers and why would he do that but when going slower he wasn't well when things were going faster he couldn't see so to perceive where he was going he would feel I learned that from that little boy. Um, an older boy, he, he would ask him at high school to jog down. He was jogging down the wrong side of the hallway. Mind you, he wasn't being the, doing the right thing, but he was doing it because his good eye was in that side. But when he'd run, he'd feel. And I like, you know, I said, why are you doing it? He had language. He said, well, I know where I am. And when he was moving, to, he, couldn't, he couldn't figure it out. So what are the tactile cues? I'm letting you know that in your school or in school environments that the student could touch, could explore. I bet you you've got a flag somewhere that's always there. Or you always have, there might be a plant in a certain area of the school that it's always there. The, 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 um, go visit uh, one of the tactile cues we used to use for one principal was a tie by the door. And we would go explore the tie that the principal had every day because he'd have one every day and go explore if it was different or the same. But all these things you can incorporate tactile working memory scale concept with uh, orientation and mobility. And back to Pascal and Ariane who painted herself, right? And needed a bath when she got home. But because of tactile working memory scale training and, and thinking about those boys, like that boy, Zachary, and other kids I've met, I said, okay, if the cane is an extension of the hand and touch, well, can we not do a tactile working memory scale partial assessment on Ariane learning how to use the cane? Um, probably can, right? So she had, she's only gotten the cane since uh, June. Her way of... of well, uh, Pascal could explain it better than I can, but her best way to understand to be able to walk down the street is holding someone's um, uh, could, uh, I forgot the word in French, in English, uh, elbow. Anyways, so touching the elbow and you can guide her everywhere. What is more tiring is if she walks by herself, because she has charge syndrome and it's tiring to not knowing, keeping her balance and all that. And she doesn't have lower field vision because of CVI mostly, but concentrating to keep um, looking straight to be able to not fall, right? So what, how she loves the cane, she picked up to it right away, wanted to use it. 
because she gets valuable information about what's in front of her and so that she can explore. So thank you, Pascal, for sharing the videos. Oh. <laughs> Is that can pop that. Keep your cane on the ground. Right. What's that? Crack. She felt it. On another video, Pascal sent me, she's tapping on the leaves. So, like, you know, she's discovering what those leaves are and is there is that solid and what's underneath so she gets to do it with her cane so she's a brilliant little girl yet again you got to know limitations right so for her it's like a bit with like like sean looking and touching right she needs vision to maintain her balance um, she doesn't have it semi six circular canals um and all this stuff, you have to under, know your student and know how it could be used and how it can be better used to be able to paint your face all over with fluorescent paint, right? So yeah, so it's tiring for her to walk independently. She prefers to hold, holding one of her parents' hands to receive feedback and maintain balance. Uh, the cane is a really good alternative, so and she's starting to use it more and more. So yeah, I think it would be a good idea to do a full tactile working memory scale with her cane use. That would be cool. So I'd like to thank the participants in this video, uh, this presentation, because without the two teachers and some of the students in our school, it wouldn't have been able, I wouldn't have been able to share all these cool videos. So Danielle, who works with little Dan Danielle, big Danielle, little Danielle, and Catherine, who is the teacher, Sean's teacher. So I asked, big Danielle uh, to talk to me about the whole process she had done with tactile working memory scale. She said touch is the most reliable sense for him. What I realize is now is that for kids who are nonverbal and are at the bottom of the Maslow pyramid, the sense of touch is vital. To touch is the way to com he communicates. It's how he figures things out, understands. It's how he is under is understood. It's also his primary way to understand how to orient himself in his environment. Touch is also essential to reassure him how to, how to show affection and bond. Presently, touch is his most reliable sense to learn. So yeah. And Catherine with Sean. Before I thought I knew about the sense of touch, but since we started the tactile working memory scale assessment with Sean, I've come to realize that touch is so important for him and he uses it, uh, he uses it so much more than I realized. When I watched the video that you shared with me, I couldn't believe the subsidity, sorry, <laughs> subtilities. He uses touch so much more than I realize, and it is, all has a purpose. Once you better understand his CVI and how to incorporate it with touch, you can help him in his day-to-day -day tasks. Sean needs training in, in a calm and uncluttered environment and repetition. I see how memory plays a part in all that he does. It's amazing to see his progress and to witness his successes. I have incorporated what I have learned from the tactile working memory scale to better teach Sean. I know it has helped him su succeed with his educational goals. Touch is more than touching. It is one of the sensory channel he uses for gathering information about the world around him. And I love that picture. That was the last day of school of his first year with us. So, and Sean, well, with new things now, anytime he learns something new, it's like, uh, what is it we're going to be able to teach him through touch? Do, 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 do. Wee, wee. Do, do, do. Well, for him to accept to go on a horse, he better know how it feels and how everything to touch it, but still can't look and listen, uh, look and touch. So, Additional resource um, I'm going to share with you guys. Um, 
if you want to scan that, this is from uh, Pop BD is a provincial outreach program of deaf blindness from the province of British Columbia. My partner uh, uh, and comrade, <laughs> and and you know to do the tactile working memory skill uh, project um, invited Jude Nicholas to do a tactile working memory skill strategies to support tactile communications. Do that QR code and you will have access to a slide, a Google slide. And it this, uh, the way we see the title in the first slide is a link directly to a YouTube video. So if you wanna hear Jude explain in Jude's way, um, then you'll have that luxury. Um, and this is a QR code for this presentation, um, but I will also send it to Anne. She has a link to it. So there's a few videos that I will have to turn off sharing because I have I only have the right to share for this presentation, but for the rest, it's all going to be in there. So that's it. I'm going to stop sharing. I think that's it. Merci. If you want to get a hold of us. The little school you didn't know existed in Ottawa, Canada. Um, my email is my first dot last name with the hyphen between Sauvé and Gaindon. You don't put hyphens and don't know how to do it anyways. But anyways, at ccjl.ca. So thank you. I don't know if there's questions, things you'd like to talk about. Oh, I just saw the comments appear now. I was too concentrated. I do have a question. My name is Renee Wolf. I'm a teacher for visually impaired in Moorhead, Minnesota, not far from Canada, actually. Um, <laughs> um, so I'm an itinerant teacher and I work with a team um, that has a student with CVI, probably I'm phase two, mid phase two, and they bought her a communication device that requires her to look at the picture before she selects what she wants to say. They, she does use some reasonably accurately, um, but I believe they're her very preferred. She kind of has them by muscle memory as to how to find them. But her team will say things like, use your eyes, use your eyes to look. Sometimes that actually does work. A lot of times it doesn't. Um, I just, I don't even know what to do with that, mm. with that team. Do I, do I just kind of let them keep using it. Um, but tactile is not really her thing, the student's thing either. Um, she tends to be pretty aggressive with her hands. And if she's I in a wheelchair. Yeah. If I don't understand what's happening in around, around me, I will be. I've had kids who are um, hitters too. But I mean, if you knew how to approach them, especially if they're CVI, there's probably vision field loss so if I come in the wrong direction I will be triggered um, Hunter the one the boy showed you he's like that so I told people to come around to inside his visual field and that's a lot easier um, I, sometimes I don't I'll be honest I don't like sometimes the communication boards because it's all visually based and it, as soon as you add more tiles to it it becomes even more complex um, and like right now I'm looking at the screen, I'm seeing all your names and every name will now become a muffled part if I don't understand to be able to see every tile in front of me, right? So, hi Renny, I get to see you now. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so it's, it's, it's a complex, I find uh, communication tools with CVI and adding touch and looking and touching uh, mm -hmm. Oh, she'll get used to it, right? She'll learn in this top right corner, top left corner, but it's all hit and miss, I find, because it's really, um, is the environment calm enough on that one day so, so she is able to do it? Is it mm, noise all of a sudden in the background and, oh, I can't look, I can't look and listen, so now you want me to touch, to, I get, like, around that too? So that's why I like telling people what well, this is what we, the student can do, but you got to remember what will damp will stop or prevent learning, right? So even with Sean, how he's, you know, he runs everywhere and he's tactile. Um, if I didn't take things in consideration, he wouldn't be able to do the things that he does. Um, he's progressed in our program because we, we let him be him and use 
what he does best. Um, that that means running around and finding number 33. I don't know where that what number will be in the school. Well, you better follow him and you'll find it. So it's finding those ways to be able to help, right? So you're asking me if I'm, I, I'm a fan of touching switches. One switch at a time would be a lot better. Okay. than having more than one thing and look what uh, Campbell does he has something tactile on it maybe having the real object that is so associated to the uh, picture or to the what he's supposed to be doing would be a right. lot better so right. yeah well I agree with help? you I, I just yes I just wanted to hear hear what you had to say so thank you I appreciate it well you're welcome and read, you know, the, the blog I put on the screen, that is someone from Perkins. Her name is Nye. Uh, their name is Nye, sorry. Um, and she has a whole bunch of blogs about things like that. She, what, what, I am not good with pronouns. They, what they learned because of um, her CVI. Not her, I can't say her. Anyways, I'm sorry. Uh, that's this person's CVI. And, uh, but it's, that person has a voice and her the blog is fantastic for that but environment you know cvi right so environment look and mm -hmm. listen positioning how tired is it is a student so yeah okay thank you you're welcome <laughs> you have people other people who uh wrote to you, I think, in the, in the chat. I think, Casey, I saw your name pop up. If you're back to and there's questions for either one of us, if I, she dares turn on her camera. But anyways, if there are any other questions, feel free. Hi, uh, my name is Megan Reimer, and I am a deaf, hard of hearing teacher in Hibbing, Minnesota. Um, I just had a quick question on how um, often we could use the um, the scale with within our teams. Should we use it for like a three year reevaluation to to start to get a baseline and then use it when we start to notice changes and in, in, in maybe the way that they're doing a certain activity or or how often would you, you recommend us using it? And that is a, the, the million dollar question. Um, I think it's it depends on the student itself. Um, for Sean, we assessed him once and reassessed him a month later with more videos because mm -hmm. we need to get to know the tool better. Um, I could probably re redo one now and because we, we worked certain things that we noticed were lacking. We gave him a gift, for example, and he hugged his intervener or his teacher and not the person who gave him the gift. So we had to teach him, yeah, you're happy, but you got to now say thank you to the right person. It's little things like that, really some little things. So yeah, did he, how is that going? Um, so all these little things you can reassess. Of course, you can redo the whole assessment. But then I, I call it about sub-assessment. I'll use Sean as an example. One of the things I didn't show it today is that we brought him to assess and we, we brought him bowling. He was coming out like the first times we can take groups out again into the community. And he had been bowling three years before, but everything that we could learn from what socially but aware and screws and ball and roll your, your turn, my turn, everything, the rules about bowling. Um, and then we talked, we had that powwow that I talked about sitting, how can, what did we learn and how can we make this activity if better so we he didn't understand the one two three my turn and then you, the other person's turn to throw the ball uh the little socially things like that which just doesn't bowling right but this helped him to learn how to play another game with another person so we noticed right away where were the gaps in different social situations but we also saw how intelligent he is um the gutter uh, I have another video. He touches the gutter with his foot, with his hand, goes on all fours. He threw a ball in the gutter, but he came back and feeling the gutter. What is this thing? But it, it's an inclination. Did the other like uh, alleys have a gutter? Um, all these things. So knowing if you give them the time to layer information, 
Um, it wasn't part of what we were trying to assess, but we got away much more information. So the third time he went bowling, guess what? The piece of the puzzles were coming, falling into place. So, but this can all be shared. So like just the activity of bowling could be reassessed e easily without doing the whole gamut again. But I think that if there's something that is not, um, you're noticing that is lacking, then you can really concentrate the, the team on that one part. There's not one student that we've reassessed because we've only in our team assessed two, right? But I could tell you that it's guided us in the right directions. And even with Gideon with the volleyball net, it's guided the staff. We haven't done a full assessment, but it's guided the staff to know that he's tactile. So he needs to touch to be able to understand certain. So we call it the aha moments of the, I, they call it like that. I know it's tactile working memory scale. And when I get an email and saying, call me and I do call the school and he's a 12 hour drive away. So I have, I can't go there often, but he, one day he figured out why there's indoor shoes and outdoor shoes because there was sand on the floor and he realized the sand came off of his shoes but up until that day he never knew why he had to go in the school take off his shoes put new shoes on clean shoes so all of a sudden the sand that he had worked played outside so teachable moment but it was all about let him him explore for five ten minutes and talk about the sand that came off of his shoes so okay he's not learning he's in grade four now and he wasn't doing maybe his math lesson or French class, but he was learning why indoor shoes are important. So, yeah. Hi. 